You're listening to an Anazal Ministries podcast. Have you guys wondered what it would be like to have a story that has Dark Knight meets Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Have you guys wondered what it would be like to listen to a grown man absolutely nerd out on one of his favorite fandoms? Well, the day is finally here. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Systematic Geekology. We are your priests to the geeks. And for more wonderfully geeky goodness, you can check us out, facebook.com slash Systematic Geekology, patreon.com slash Systematic Geekology. Help us keep the lights on. I am one of your hosts. I am Joe. I, if you could not tell, am an avid Turtles fan. And recently, in preparation for a little something special that you guys are going to have to tune in to the end of the episode for, I have been going back and consuming all things Turtles between the comics and the TV show. And the movies, right? And the movies, yes. Oh, sorry. I am Joshua Knoll. I'm a fourth-year biblical studies student. And uh, recently... I just want to let you guys know, this is the whole reason I'm here is just to say this. Recently, I've been geeking out by, on uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles video games. Uh, I've got the Cowabunga collection on the Nintendo Switch. Nice. Man, what a good time. Yeah, that Cowabunga collection is phenomenal. Such a love letter to the original like Nintendo games and all of those kinds of things. Fantastic. I am TJ Blackwell, and I wouldn't say I'm a huge Turtles fan. I'm uh, 5'6", 185, uh, but I do love most of the Turtles media that I've consumed. Uh, it's always been great, been nearly ever-present in my life, so kind of just wouldn't be right for me to not be on this episode. <laughs> Love it. Hey, everyone. I am Will Rose. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that I'm like a huge Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle fan, but it was kind of like late um, 80s, early 90s when I was uh, you know, kind of moving away from geek culture and thinking that like, um, man, I, maybe I should do like other things rather than like consume all this kind of geek stuff. Uh, but I certainly learned my lesson that that was not the right uh, move in my life and got back into the geekdom and the geek first later on in my life. Uh, but you cannot escape the impact that the Turtles had just uh, in the zeitgeist of popular culture and definitely watched at a distance. And I will also share that I've been geeking out on uh, rewatching the original 1990s uh, movie because the movie was actually filmed in my hometown in Wilmington, North Carolina. A lot of it mm -hmm. was filmed there. And uh, some of my friends when we were in high schools were actually extras in the movie. When you go and watch like the, the foot clans, like um, hang out where they're skateboarding and like training and doing all that stuff. And it has a bunch of kids and teenagers in the background. Well, some of my friends are in the background. I couldn't really find them when I rewatched the movie, but uh, they're there. They're there as extras because it was in, in Wilmywood when, when, uh, when it was filmed. Yeah. I, uh, I went to school in Wilmington. I was almost one of the extras in um, winter soldier because it was going to be filmed there. Then some legal stuff happened and it wasn't filmed there. So I know that sucks. Dang. Also uh, just a public correction. Cowabunga collection isn't out yet. I'm playing the games that are going to be in the collection. I'm preparing for it. And I'm just going to play them again when it comes out. Yeah. Nice. All right. Yeah. I grabbed my switch to look for it and I was like, well, I gotta, I gotta buy this. And then <laughs> yeah, I was confused, but I understand yeah. now. Thank you. Yeah. They've shown some of the, some of the preview stuff on, on YouTube and it looks uh, absolutely yeah. phenomenal. Um, so diving into today's episode, huh? um, for those of you that have been listening to my little intros along the way for like, for what seems like the past years at this point, um, I have been so loving 
the last Ronin, and now it's time to talk about it. it just wrapped up, um, and so today we're gonna kind of set the table. You know, the, the idea here is that we give you guys the plot synopsis, and you go out and read it in, in preparation for when we get into the spoilers and just to you know read a killer story. And so today is kind of going to be a love letter. To all things turtles, and like I said at the top, um, stay tuned for the end where we have a very, very special surprise for you guys. So, cracking into this, the last Ronin who wants to dive into a uh, Reader's Digest version of what this story is all about. Well, if I could just set up just a moment, like I, I love comics that have this kind of futuristic dystopia kind of feel to it. So like I grew up an X-Men fan. So Days of Future Past was one of my favorite stories by Chris Claremont and John Byrne. And then um, you have like the Hulk, uh, uh, what is it called? It's called Future Imperfect by Peter David. Um, and so, and then you got Frank Miller's, like you said, The Dark Knight and these kind of future, what, is, what would our heroes look like in a future if they were kind of beat up or they were disillusioned or there was some kind of future or something happened that kind of derailed what their work were trying to do, make the world a better place, but the world isn't a better place, it's a worse place. Uh, what does that look like? And so, um, I've, I've definitely have seen a lot of stuff with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and read a few books here and there. Uh, but when I when I saw the last Ronin was coming out and put it, being put out by Kevin Eastman and his whole crew of creators, I was like, man, I got to check that out. The covers look really awesome. And when I flipped through the first book, the art looks really good, really crisp. And I was like, man, this looks like a like you said, a dark night or day, days of future past or future imperfect version of the teenage mutant Ninja turtles and kind of uh, 20, 10 years down the road um, uh, when, when things are older or, or perhaps even worse. So that's what you get with this story. And, and I agree, Joe, 100% that man is so good. And when every issue came out, I couldn't wait to read it to see what was going to happen next. Yeah. If you're, if your biggest problem with turtle stories has always been that they seem too happy uh, the last run is definitely the run you should check out. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's yeah. the thing about yeah. the turtles that seems to be uh, the the turtles is a story a story of two different sides, right? On one side, you have more of the cartoony, lighter toned sort of presentation of the turtles, but. TMNT is one of those franchises that kind of has a way of flourishing in darker storytelling. And especially when you look at the comics run, I would, to piggyback off of what you said, TJ, you know, if you like that idea of these characters presented adjacent to where they're at, still some of the same kind of joking sarcasm bantery sort of sort of deal but like in a darker world where there's there's stakes and there's weight to things and things like that i would absolutely suggest checking out the entirety of the comic run that's happening right now not just ronin but like the mainline title as well because they do not shy away from that style of storytelling and Eastman does a lot of the the uh, artwork for that in general, and so it's it's just so gorgeous. Yeah, I would try to summarize the book, but I was scared that I would go into spoilers. That I would I would do it. So if if someone else wants to kind of set up the premise, um, you know, from the get go, you kind of kind of get a feel of what's going on, and there's a surprise at the end of the first issue, and then it kind of builds from there. Um, so we don't want to spoil anything, but I, I'm, when I explain things, I spoil things. So if somebody else wants to summarize what the premise is without spoiling stuff, um, I'd say, I say you guys go for it. <laughs> somebody goes for it. I'm, I'm thinking really hard to come up with a way to make this sound accurate, but also not, you know, spoilery. Right. Well, I, yeah, you wouldn't, I wouldn't give away what happens at the end of issue one, but you could set up kind of what's, what's going on. I'm afraid that I would oversimplify it. Yeah. And, and honestly, I think to be able to say something along the lines of, you know, dark night 
meets TMNT kind of darkest timeline uh, turtles sort of thing is pretty much the hook. It's pretty much what, what, you know, that pretty much sets the, sets the table plus or minus some specific story beats that honestly, I don't think we could geek explain well enough to, to do it the justice that it deserves. Like this is, you're talking about a story that, which cool little side note for those of you that didn't know, um, this is a story that's decades in the making. When they were first penning the 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 initial comic run, they had thought up this story 25 years down the line and kind of put it on the shelf and dusted it off and turned it into a, a, a full-on miniseries and things like that and so this has kind of been a a brainchild that's been stewing for quite a long time and so i i really think as far as that goes you you have all of the hook that that you could need i think you can probably say though like you know there's one there's there's one turtle that's focused on in the first issue and you don't really know which turtle it is out right. of the four. And, and by the end of the first issue, you do know. Um, so, so there's that teaser to, to read is it focuses on one. You're like, Oh, I think they're, I think everybody's gone. I think there's only one left. What's going on here. And then you find out a little bit more what that looks like and which turtle it is that's still alive and still roaming around and who is the Ronin. It's in the, it's in the title, the last Ronin, which means there's, they're a, a master, less samurai right is that what a run in means yes uh their their master is gone so they are alone and and so you figured out there um by the end of issue one who who that is uh joshua yeah so joe your uh your little nugget that this has been set up for a long time that's uh that's one of those information nuggets that uh really brings me to the show i mean i'm in it and i'm editor so that that's also part of what brings me to the show but that's the kind of thing that i'm like man i just love learning these kind of things about these comics um if we're going to do comparisons, I think my comparison for this would be Old Man Logan, but Turtles and a lot more Samurais. Yeah, yeah, that's good. That's a good pull. Yeah, yep. I'm, Old Man Logan's another good one. That's yep. a good shout. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's so funny to me that you have this this presentation where like an editor's note, tons of cowabongas, absolutely spam the sound effects. Um, but you have... Cow a bummer. <laughs> You have this this on one side, you know, colorful and bright and fun and almost the apex of kids Saturday morning cartoons for a certain generation. And honestly, for multiple generations at this point, because of the different iterations that have taken place and things like that. But, Mm -hmm. you know, you you uh, I think for for. This they've they've so done a great job at satisfying the desire for people to see, you know, what happens when, you know, everything breaks loose. What happens when, you know, everything goes wrong and kind of I think in a lot of ways, this kind of storytelling really emphasizes the hero's journey in a way that almost plays off of the things that have come before it. You know what I mean? Like you can tell somebody who's a little bit more, uh, well-worn, I guess, but has underneath the surface has like a sarcastic sense of humor or has, you know, it can mm-hmm. kind of it can, knows how to be jovial, but has been beat up and things like that. I think that, to me, I, I and and I won't go any further because you know I don't I I too, not am not sure that you know will I could go any further into this without you know letting the cat out of the bag so to speak, which is in part two of this conversation. But like that presentation to me, I I, I struggle to find one better. And yes, I am one hundred percent biased. I I you're talking about. The the this in Power Rangers are the the heart of nostalgia for me. And so but but really, I think all in all, um, this 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 takes what has already been done well for the Turtles to an entirely different level, you know. 
Yeah, it yeah. still has those moments where it's funny. And you still have those classic turtles banter. Yeah. Uh, which is, you know, super important to lighten the tone at, at some points. Uh, but it is not, you know, not pervasive. It is definitely still a very dark story. Just yeah. a, a bit of levity sometimes. Yeah. Um, I don't think this counts as spoiler, but what they end up doing with the April character, that that was the part where I was like, hey, made me think of Old Man Logan a little bit and some of mm-hmm. how he related to certain people. And B was just kind of like, a, oh, okay. It, it brought a lot of, ironically, brought a lot of humanity to our main protagonist. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and I like the those stories. Those I, yeah, I like the the you know um those martial art kung fu stories where there is someone who's learning, uh they have backdrops and backstories of them training in their sensei and then they're kind of a lost or disillusioned. Uh they're broken, they've given up, uh, but then they they find a way to get their hope back in the next generation or mm-hmm. those who are younger than them. And and you know, as someone who's uh, pushing fifty who's been in the the ministry business for a while is easy to get like disillusioned or be like, Oh, what's the difference? Uh, what difference is it going to make? And that, but then, you know, there are moments when like the next generation or people around you, or even like folks in this community, they, they give you hope and they like, Hey, let's keep doing this. Let's keep, let's keep training. Let's keep fighting the good fight. Um, and so when you see that kind of, I love, I love those stories when, when you see someone get their hope back or even try to pass it on to the next generation. And that's what's happening in this book. And it's, uh, it's inspiring. It's good. Yeah. It's, you can't help, but think, you know, in terms of our world, you know, moving quick to a dystopia, whether it's nuclear fallout or pandemics or whatever you want to, uh, lean into, you know, what, what would I do in that situation? I put myself in the story and be like, how would I act? What, what gifts do I have that could contribute, uh, to either the resistance or to make the world a better place? Yeah, uh, two things. We should do an episode about nuclear energy. I think that's a valid topic. But also, I love what they did yes. with Casey in this run. And you guys know what that means. But those of you who haven't read it, you'll just have to yeah. read it and find out what yeah. I mean. What a good, I, what a good I think that there. might have been a double entendre. And I hope it was because that, that was that was funny. <laughs> Clever. Nice. Nice. Bravo. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's for me this story quickly jumped into easily the top three uh, i i would have to really consider whether or not it's the top turtles story for me of of all time um there was a run back in the 90s called uh teenage Mutant ninja turtles urban legends and for for those of, for for you shellheads out there you that that's a <laughs> very very divisive run of the sto- of the turtles because it gets very violent it's very fast paced it's very 90s in in everything and so for me it was this almost felt like a continuation of urban legends which for for those of you that grew up with action figures, if you ever saw the Donatello as a cyborg uh, action figure that has made the rounds, that's it's actually from this run. Um, because it turns yes. out that most people that you ask when, you know, you ask what is your favorite, what is the seminal Turtles run for you, for most people, regardless of which one it is, generally it involves a turtle dying. You know what I mean? They're just right. they, that is there has been no shortage of stories that have centered around the death of turtles. Yeah, for me, um, I very seldomly made it through the movies or any of the cartoon shows, not because I didn't like them, but because I like the video games so much. It's like I'm talking like the old arcade ones. Yeah. That any time I started any turtle property, it just immediately made me say, wait a minute. I could just be playing a Ninja Turtle game <laughs> and then I would proceed to do that. So, yeah, uh, comparing this storyline to the video game storylines, which were you beat up bad guy, you win. Yeah, I'm a, I'm a fan of the storyline. Yeah, this is definitely better. If I had to choose how to spend my time, it might depend on how many people I have to play that game with me or not. <laughs> 
What was the first video arcade game? Was that the one where they have all four of them and it's kind of it's like the old X Men video game where it's kind of scrolling yeah. like right to left? I don't know if that was going first, through. but man, that was good. Yeah, my, down the road we have a barcade down yeah. with retro yeah. um, video games and and yeah. pinball machines, and that's that's in there. And yeah, that uh, one's good. Um, Turtles in Time, obviously great. Um, and then the GameCube one, the original GameCube Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle game, that was gold. Just nice. plain gold. <laughs> yeah, that's probably why it was so expensive. You know how hard it is to ride a gold disc? <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, you're, we're, like I said, we're talking the the epicenter of me as a kid, Saturday morning cartoons and playing uh, Nintendo and Super Nintendo and playing games like that. That side scrolling, I don't know if that side scrolling Turtles game is the um, first one, <laughs> but it's certainly the first notable one that I can think of. Right for the Turtles, oh, yeah, and then of sure. course Turtles in Time is awesome which fun facts there was actually two different endings to turtles in time depending on which platform you bought it on there's a little proceed to explain there's a little what other platform do i need to play so so because of (laughs) it's on um sega and it's on the nintendo and so they depending on which version you play depends on which there was like production issues and licensing issues and such and things and so there's like uh there are some uh levels that are just in different spots there are different you know uh, character sprites and things like that that are in one that aren't in the other and so on and so forth I know we want to get back to talking about the comic, but I just have to say some of my favorite memories growing up, even though Ninja Turtles were never like one of my main IPs, main things I geeked out on. Some of my favorite memories were trying to sneak out my gaming console because I wasn't allowed to have it leave the house. So trying to sneak it out of my book bag, like I'm going to go study at the neighbor's house because the neighbor had a pool. So we played Ninja Turtle games, jump in the pool, order pizza. And it was just a whole thing that it was like we just made our own parties occasionally. Ordered pizza great. because, you know, you that's to. important. Yeah. And that's important. Yeah. 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 On top Yo, Kawabunga, as you do a cannonball into the pool. It's just that's that was the life, man. That's nice. nice. Yeah, that's like I'm, I, some of my first memories that I have with my cousins are watching the first Turtles movie. Like that is very much a, a a part of of my memory um, and just kind of instilled because you're talking about some of the most beautiful puppet work that has ever hit the big screen. And all of that being mm, practical yeah. and all of that, like that phenomenal i could not go go back and listen to the episode that we did that brandon and i did (laughs) on the movie for my love letter to that while and that once you're done of course with this love letter to the turtles yeah Yeah. and the that was a pantheon of you know hollywood puppeteering i would go uh muppets in space and then you know that first teenage mutant ninja turtles oh where does just me personal all this (laughs) labyrinth's at the top yeah um I I don't know if I've ever seen these movies all the way through just sitting down all at once, but I've certainly seen all of the pieces a lot. Like it seemed to be one of those things where when it was on TV, I never owned it, but it was like, I'm going to watch this and I would get through like 30 minutes and then play the game. So I don't I, I know what happened in each part, but I don't think I ever saw it all the way through at once. Just never seemed to work out that way. Yeah, you it's you valid. need to change that. That is a thing that needs to <laughs> yeah, be remedied. Yeah. Or I just keep that's playing your the recommendation video. this week. That's your recommendation this week. You sit down, watch it, start to end. Yep. Only if I can find a way to play the game while I'm watching it. <laughs> oh my goodness! You have ADHD. You just do both. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I love doing both. I used to watch Star Wars while playing Dead Space, and that was just one of my favorite experiences in college. Wow, it's a good time. <laughs> there you go. Um. So for me, I cannot help but what read Last Ronin and be like, OK, somebody needs to fork over, you know, a couple million dollars and make a movie ah. of this 100 mm. percent. Like, I, I fully understand that if you jump right into a cinematic presentation of Last Ronin, 
basically turtles fans will be the ones that will understand what's going on and enjoy it the most and all of that kind of stuff. But Hey, I'm a turtles fan. So I I'm going to be selfish and say, yeah, just go ahead and do that. You know what I mean? But like before that, before this one city at war, which was a, a, a seminal nineties arc, a lot of turtle fans would point to city at war as being another one. That's like, you know, everything's breaking loose it's it's nuts all of the gangs are are at war with each other and so on and so forth which was kind of acted as uh when it was collected kind of acted as a capstone for the original run of um laird and eastman and there when they were the mm-hmm. ones that were steering the ship for the turtles before it ended up in other hands um but like no matter no matter what story you end up necessarily going with honestly i i think you could tack any of these onto the 90s universe that was already created you know what i mean make that the start and have all of this act as kind of like the the epilogue of that universe that we saw you know what i mean now, would you want it live action, CGI, or puppets? Or would you want like a gritty, like cartoon, like 2D animation, not like the uh, computer 3D stuff, but like a 2D animation, like from the 90s that, that would be, I like almost like an Invincible. We were talking about Invincible earlier that, um, you know, if you guys are listening out there, maybe you'll hear that conversation one day. It caused some controversy among us. But the, uh, uh, but like, would you want to see the last Ronin as like a maid? for TV, like streaming hour and a half, two hour cartoon or like live action, go to the theater and see it. What would be your preference? So I would either want to see a live action, like basically what we had for the nineties, uh, cartoon with the puppets Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, make as much as possible practical, you know what I mean? Like to, to really keep the same kind of tone or, keep the same kind of tone as the eighties cartoon and make like a gritty stylized version of the eighties cartoon and have it that same kind of 2d animation. But either way, I think that that's, that's your ticket because this, this so fits in like if, if you, I guess the one thing that I can, that, that I can really emphasize with this story is if you like the tone and tenor and style of storytelling that kind of preeminates the, the throughout the 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 different turtles iterations this is for you because that it, there's there's kind of a sameness in the best possible way to a lot of this stuff and so so either direction if you kind of tack this on to that as a continuation of those stories I, I think you, you can't go wrong. So I think in a perfect world, they would treat it how they treated the Clone Wars at first. Let mm. Gindy Tartakovsky make an animated movie ah, of The Last there Ronin. You go. There it is. It's going to look different. Mm-hmm. I'm going to watch it. I love that art style. I love Gindy Tartakovsky. Me too. And do a live action. Yeah. 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 Puppets. I am. Um, so if okay. the creators are out there listening to this by any chance, then that's our plug and that's what we would want to see happen. And whatever we can do to help support that, you know, let us know yeah. and we'll be the voice actors or extras in whatever you create. Yeah. And this just so happens to potentially be an example of that. More on that in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Gindy Tartakovsky, I can absolutely bankroll uh you know, a last Ronin movie. You just give me enough notice and a ski mask. <laughs> we'll make it come down. Systematic ecology <laughs> presents. There we go. Ah, a, a systematic ecology production. Yeah. 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 Well, I, I think, you know, in terms of like JJ Abrams and the star Wars, you know, when they rebooted star Wars and they had the, the sequel trilogy, like they, they went back to that, the practical effects. Yeah. Yeah. We have, the gifts and the technology to make, you know, CGI look really, really good. But, but there is something to be said about practical effects and, and building up your certain 
um, aliens or puppets or whatever to make it look real. And, and so, yeah, I, I glad that that I'm glad that that is a turn that movies and IPs are leaning into and turtles could do the same. That is absolutely one of the only things that I like more about the sequel trilogy than I did the uh, prequel trilogy mm-hmm. was just, I like Return to the Practical Effects. The newer Star Wars Battlefront game was the first game that they did on-site filming for video game locations. So that was nice. super cool, too. Yeah. Also, there's a fun video of me annihilating people online to um, the Guardians of the Galaxy album to that game. So huh. that's yeah, awesome. I thought I thought you were going to say that <laughs> there's a fun video of you online destroying me on that game. And that's just not that's true. That's not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I would true. love to have a have a have a match with TJ. TJ is a master video game player. Uh, he is one of those people who know frame by frame how many frames it takes for players to do moves in Smash Bros. And I just can't compete with that yet. Thanks for the warning. Thanks yeah. for the warning. Systematic yeah. Ecology Smash Tournament. There we go. I'm there. There we go. <laughs> I am down. Um. So yeah, I I think. And honestly, so uh, I'm not gonna. Th- this might be my my one hot take for the episode, but I think you stylize the turtle is, but the Ronin, it, uh, in the same kind of way that um, the what was it the the 2010s movie tried to do the the out of the shadows or whatever. I saw the first one. I didn't see the mm-hmm. second one because the first one was a dumpster fire um but that that kind of hulking you know what i mean that big sort of way of doing it Mm -hmm. i think you i think that fits great in a darker timeline i think if it's if you're trying to make any kind if you're trying to make them any kind of like i guess family friendly or approachable or any kind of lighthearted or any of that making five hulking turtle monsters probably isn't the way to go um but yeah, and to the whole practical effect thing, if you notice, like for all of you you more, uh, movie geeks out there, the, you, you tend to find this this wave of fan reception towards CGI and kind of that almost simulated environment that at first they are it's like, wow it's so beautiful you know you think about something like avatar right B- basically pocahontas in space but but it was gorgeous stunning movie like reg- say what you will as far as this the storyline and the fact that it's problematic at points and all of those kinds of things it's it's a an absolutely gorgeous movie but there's something inherent to the human mind that when you see something that's fake or manufactured, your brain is going to subconsciously tell you it's fake and manufactured and take you out of the moment. That's just, that's there's the proven science is there as far as when, when the eye catches something that's CGI. And, and yes, again, I am biased because I'm also a huge horror fan. And I grew up in the era of Tom Savini that was basically doing 90% of horror movie effects and doing all of which with practical effects. And so like all of these different kill scenes that you get and all of these different moments, they're all practical stuff. So for me, I like, yes, that the turtles looked their best. Yes. There was a, there's a bit of camp to the fact that the, the mouth moves about, you know, this is why we need to, we need to have the uh, video up on, on uh, Patreon. But yeah, basically for those of you that haven't seen it, which a go and see it, but B the, the mouth moves ever so slightly, very much in a, stereotypical what you would think of a puppet's mouth moving Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i'm a big fan of a a combining um practical and effects and cgi i I think they do best together um you can only go so far with practical effects and i like to stretch the imagination but when something's just cgi it tends to be kind of cringy um and with that i i really just wanted to say concerning the avatar blue people movie the only part of that that I think makes it worthwhile, the only thing I like about it is its little corner in Disney World at night. It's beautiful when it's lit up. Super cool. Yeah, nice. I got to say, I love that movie. 
And I was very impressed that, you know, they did what Josh said. They mixed practical <laughs> and CGI. Super impressive that James Cameron just found all of those nine foot blue people to film with. It's <laughs> underrated fact about the movie. Gorgeous and very relatable. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. I would also betray the U.S. military to go out with a nine foot tall blue woman. Listen, I'm just going to say, if you're going to tell that story, you should at least sing all the colors of the wind. <laughs> oh, come on, okay. guys. Hold on. That was the serious. first movie that I ever saw in 3D in the movie theater. It, yeah. I, so there's a small part of me that's like, huh, I have fond memories of that movie. And then there's other parts of me that are like, again, po- Pocahontas in space, guys. That's really legitimately what it is, is Pocahontas in space. So, um, so before. Rubber band. <laughs> I want you to understand, Josh. Think I'm that an ignorant savage. I want you to understand, <laughs> Josh, that it is your absolute uh, responsibility to pepper in songs from little little snippets of songs from Pocahontas and stuff like that. Don't worry about it. The mouse won't mind. Deal. He's gonna have so much Deal. fun. <laughs> so much fun editing this. One. I can't wait to hear what this sounds like. But yeah, so I, I don't know. I could I could go on and on. Um, but before we go any for any further to jump back to the last Ronin, I'll leave my opinions last because I, I really don't think I'm going to shock anybody with what I give this book. So Josh, let's go ahead and start with you. What, uh, what, what would you rate this, rate this book? I'm going to apologize to everybody in advance. He's going to say six. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not. I, I still think it was really good. Um, when I read issue one, I would have given issue one like a nine and a half, almost ten. Absolute masterpiece. Beautiful. I love the little twist at the end of that. I thought it was so cool. For me, as the series went on, each issue was just more like, okay. And it just kind of went... By the time it got to the end, it kind of fell flat for me. And those last two issues, I probably would have rated a six. Overall, I'm going to say... I'd probably say seven and a half or eight, depending on the day. Today, I'm feeling good. Overall, I like the vibe of it, so I'm going to go with eight. But that's also, I have this Marvel bias where Marvel does this, oh, you're the last person left storyline so often that it just feels overdone to me. And I don't think most people would have that experience. So so first off, Josh, you're fired. Second off, go ahead, Will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, um, you know, it, it's when you tell a grand epic story, you know, and you have like three acts or four acts or two acts, or how many acts is the, the middle part is always like, how do you keep you, how do you keep it going? And how do you land the plane? How do you end it? Right. I, I agree that first, first issue is just fantastic. And, you know, yeah, in the middle, you know, you're going, you got to tell a story, you got to have a hero's journey, you got to have the struggle, you got to build the background. And I, for me, it, it kept like, answer, I had questions and it kept answering those questions. Um, if this was a 12 issue miniseries, it could have gotten really long there in the middle, but, but it's five, uh, five issues. And, and I think the middle kind of kept my attention and then, yeah, you could a little more predictable at the end, but, but I don't think you could have ended it any other way. And even in the final issue, there's an epilogue that you're like, Oh, we could do more. There could be the last run in part two. Uh, the last run in strikes back. I don't know the, um, the last run in strikes. Back. <laughs> you know, so so I I give it a a, a solid uh, eight point five, and I love I love the um I love the art too. The art was really crisp and inked and colored really well. Yeah, you can go ahead. Yeah, that art was fantastic. I, I love that. Oh well, uh, also I. I want to say about my rating, there are some things, and I've shared this before, there are some things that are automatic wins. You know, you have your biases towards story types. Um, For me, if it's a time loop, if it's shapeshifters, if it's pirates, I'm automatically going to rate it higher. And I have to say this about my rating. Anytime there's just flashbacks at all, I just can't stand flashbacks. Ah, I I automatically rate something lower. So like those first couple seasons of the Arrow on CW were rough. We're really Dude, rough. You were not a fan of Lost. Good. Not a fan of Lost. <laughs> I I struggled with Lost. I didn't like it, but I had to see it. Yeah, <laughs> it was one of those. You That's know? a whole other episode we can yeah. talk about. But yeah, flashbacks. I, yeah, if you're gonna do a yeah. future story, you gotta do a flashback. If you don't yeah, do yeah that's actually. You gotta do it. It's just. That's why. That's why Josh's memory is so bad. 
He can't stand having real life flashbacks. Yeah. I just prevent myself from remembering anything right. so I don't have to experience Flashbacks that. are triggering. I get it. It's also why I don't dream. Mm-hmm. That's why. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, for me, yeah. TJ, uh, I'm going to say, I, for, first of all, I want to say my scale and Josh's scale are very different. I have to actually like something for it to go above a six. To me, six and up is something I'm still going to read. Yeah. Too many people, you know, read reviews and I was like, oh, it's a six. That's garbage. That's awful. Like a, a one star review is more compelling to a lot of people than a six. Right. Me included, to be fair. But <laughs> I'm also going to give it an eight. That means it is one of my favorite comic books that I've read definitely recently, probably all time. I do not rank things comparatively two other things of the same type. Me, it's just one to ten. How much do I like it? I don't do that whole comparison thing. That's usually not fair. So, mm. solid eight. I loved it. I'll probably read it again in the next couple weeks. Cool. So, okay. Nobody's going to be surprised. Drum roll. Uh, yeah. Man, I give this... I would give this a 10. I think as far as... As far as this this story goes, I think you, it, it literally ticks all of the boxes. You know what I mean? It, it, for me, having grown up with the eighties cartoon that like, they did not like some of their best stories did not hold back when it came to there being stakes and weightiness and all of those kinds of things. And then you have the comic run, which Literally, so so for those of you that don't know, at the very first uh, issue of TMNT has the death of Shredder. They, this is not this is not a, a like a new thing, you know what I mean? To have mm-hmm. to have these kinds of stories told and stuff like that. So to me, it it took all of this this stylization that the Turtles has beca- have become known for. Right. That's the one thing that that Kevin Eastman and Peter Laird did like expertly, like literally to a T was have that rebel spirit and then set themselves Mm -hmm. up to make it so that way you could not separate the turtles from that rebellious spirit that just it, it became ingrained with the IP. And so the way that they were able to set the pace and set the tone for how a turtle's story is is told, I, I guess for me, being an avid fan, that kind of predictability factor that you guys that you guys touch on, to me, doesn't read as predictability. It reads as, well, of course, that's how a turtle story is going to be told. That's how that's how you tell in an authentic way the, a turtle story. And for me, I, it, it helps to know that little tidbit that I threw out there about understanding just how old this story concept is, and the fact that this is coming directly from the mind of one of the co-creators in such a direct way that it has his fingerprints all over it. And and to me, Absolutely. some of the very, very best turtle storytelling came from the two originals before it was it, it was given off to to for to other hands to handle. And so for me, I am quite possibly admittedly the audience for for Ronin, which I, I, I hope that how good this story is. Right. You, the thing you hear from every from from each individual one of us in our own rankings, our own takes on things. It's still good, even if we had issues with it, it's still like uh, so ve- oh, yeah. such a very good story. I just happen to think that, like, for me is up there for like geeky masterpiece sort of sort of echelon uh, of story that like I, I really hope that this story goes off and creates a whole new generation 
of people that have this kind of passion and very obviously like nerd out on this uh, on this particular IP. I just for me, I I think from I think from one to five and everything in between the way that they did what they did. And I'm like, I'm chomping at the bit to get into specifics here, but without going into specifics, the way that they hit each one of the, the beats that they hit along the way, I think every single one of them bullseye dead on the mark hit for me. Oh yeah. I, since I do most of my comics digitally these days, I buy very few comics. This is probably still going to be one that I buy. Yeah. Fantastic yeah. stuff. Absolutely. And I would imagine, Joe, if this was reversed, if this was somehow like a Captain America miniseries that was an absolute masterpiece yeah. and it ends with, you know, Captain America giving his big monologue that to me, I'd be the one going, of course, this is how a Captain America story goes. And I'd be getting the Josh, that was just so predictable. It's Captain America. That's where you have to do that. Mm-hmm. so i get it so and they're like pristine the comic books themselves are like this kind of pristine extra sized kind of thick almost hardbound uh thick books that you could collect and put it by your graphic novels and put it on your shelf it's not just a small little floppy comic or you know uh it's it's kind of a pristine size that that you could put up on your bookshelf and, and even have like its title is on the spine uh, for each comic. So they're yeah, extra, yeah. extra. It costs a little more, but they're, um, there's extra pages and extra story there. It carries a lot of weight, literally, and uh, and with a story as well. Yeah, yeah. We like to talk about sometimes comics are just fun. They're comics, and sometimes comics are art. This would be one of those cases where this was art. Like, the way yeah, it was yeah. done, the grittiness, the stylistic choices they made. Yeah. This yeah. was art. And I think it helps that like for anybody who is who has spent any time listening to a Kevin Eastman interview, the, he, he oftentimes cites uh, Jack Kirby as as his main inspiration. And so and so um, you'll get the joke in a minute, guys. Um, the, so, so to me, that same kind of motif rings true for for this that you can you can almost see the inspiration in his work from guys like Jack Kirby and stuff like that. And for me, I'm so stoked at the idea of the collection of this. No clue what I haven't heard anything come across as far as what it's going to look like or anything like that. But I'm sure that he'll be doing a like a collector's edition some kind of beautiful art piece for it and things like that and i have all five of the paperbacks i'll you know but i'll still be getting the collection for this one just because i in in my mind's eye i can already see the fact that it's going to be absolutely stunning so Mm -hmm. i just want a good omnibus yeah always coming yeah, I have been waiting for people, for somebody to come along and to put the effort at, into collecting the the Mirage run and the Image run and all of these beautiful pieces that just I just want. A, I'm also I'm also a geek, so I want just a giant thick book of Turtles comics. At the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to. That's why Invincible's so good. The omnibuses, there are like three of them, and they're all like this thick. Yeah, I don't understand why you would want to collect trash all in one place. That's what trash cans are for. I'm just saying. (laughs) Invincible is one of the five books I'd give a 10 out of 10, just for the record. (laughs) So so the word that I'm looking for, the word that I'm looking for here is anyway. So drum roll. (laughs) We have been building up to this. And so we figure who better to chime in on this conversation than one of the co-creators himself. I'm going to be throwing it to future me who will be sitting down with Kevin Eastman himself to get his thoughts on the last Ronin. Take it away, future me. How's your uh, how's your day going? Oh, wonderful, wonderful! I have been in anticipation for this conversation. I've been a Turtles fan for 
my entire life. So getting a chance to speak to one of the guys that we get to do what we do because we get to stand on the on the shoulders of giants like yourself to to be able to um, talk about your work and and wax philosophically about these awesome stories that you guys are putting out. Well, well, thanks. No, and, and it's, you know, that's, uh, you know, to sum up everything, I always start my interviews, which is thanking the shoulders of giants I firmly stand upon that inspired me and, and paved the way uh, for me to be able to do what I do, what Peter and I uh, were able to do back in the day with the publishing, self-publishing the Turtles. And then, you know, where it went from there has just been, a, you know, an epic blessing of um, uh, just one of those things that, you know, you thank your lucky stars every day for all the fans that made it possible and all the original fans, parents who spot all those original <laughs> toys and comics, um, right. But, you know, given me such a wonderful life and, a you know, a fulfillment of a childhood dream of uh, you know, drawing comics every day. So it's, it's, it's a real pleasure to be here and chatting with you. So how does it, how does it feel to know that on that point, like you've created this thing that spans generations, right? I, I remember having conversations with with some of my uncles and, and people who came before me that were super into the Turtles when they first came out. And then as I'm a kid, I'm into it and showing it to my nephew who's now 16. And and it, it's it's this this legacy that spans generations all stemming from this same concept. That's, it's, you know, humbling, um, it comes to mind immediately, always, um, mind blowing, of course, um, times, uh, infinity, <laughs> you know? Um, but I think it's just, you know, cause you know, you have to go back to the very, very first thought, which is, you know, Peter and I just wanted to be like our hero, Jack Kirby and, and, and tell comic stories and, and produce our own comics. So we wrote and drew the first issue as a complete story because we never, imagine there would be a second issue or a third issue or anything else. It was just, here's our one shot, here's our characters. And, and we just couldn't have been more thrilled <clears throat> to have it, um, have it have sold and worked in the first place as a comic series and then go beyond those boundaries and um, be embraced by that original audience base, which is, you know, at the height of the comics, I think we probably had, you know, a hundred thousand fans, which is, my, you know, it was epic. And in its day when it went to be a cartoon show, it was, many millions more um and that was great and we said well this is going to be a you know something that's going to be a um, um pop culture event in two years people you know it's going to be going to find us in the discount bins and we're never you know it, that's going to be it but what a what a great ride and what a great time and you know we'll sort of move on to the next thing and to be here almost 40 years later you know i'm i was drawing you know, turtle covers this morning before, uh, you know, we get on to chat, I'm still working on it, still having the time of my life. Um, you know, I don't own the turtles anymore, but I still get to work on them. Um, and it's just, uh, just one of those things that just, is, is just fantastic. And, you know, the generational aspect that you mentioned is even more mind blowing because one, it worked with you, you know, with say, like you said, you're, 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 your uh, folks then to you then to you know here we are in in, in 2022 and and we're still finding you know new turtle fans or new fans are finding the turtles i guess um and that's that's crazy jumping into the last ronin i this this story is such a uh, such an awesome thing because you can you can look at this as a jumping on point an opportunity to show new people the turtles in this this gritty stylized world but at the same token honestly it's it's almost like a love letter to so many of us that have been with the turtles through the different iterations because you could stick the last ronin on the tail end of so many of these different iterations of the turtles and it works you know no, thanks, and, and it's and it's and I think it one of the one of the great things is uh, that we've been so fortunate about is is you know the idea of the last running came from an idea that Pete and I wrote together in 1987, and it was sort of looking 30 years down the road of what the Turtles' quote unquote final story might be, um, based obviously this is pre toys, pre everything else, and um, based on the original Mirage series. Every version of the Turtles since then. You know, we, you know, we got busy and we never got it around to do, telling that story. Every version of the turtle since then is based around those same components, the same heart and soul of, 
you know, the four turtles, a father figure, a, you know, a sister, you know, Casey, the, the, the family that makes up the core of the turtles and the universe of um, the turtles has been uh, in every version since right up till the, the one I've been involved with the most um, in recent years is the last 10, 12 years of the IDW comic series, which uh, Tom Waltz and, and the whole IDW uh, team has crafted. So it, it sort of, when we looked at approaching issue 100, where are we going to go from here? I dusted off the story and I said, Tom, this is a story that Pete and I wrote and I think it fits here. We can go, you know, all dark night on it. We can, you know, address the Mirage universe. So it's not a IDW universe. It's not any particular universe, but it is definitely strongly rooted in the original universe. And let's tell this future story. Um, and, uh, and, and we had hoped it might be as well received as the ongoing comics, which still sell very well. Uh, we're so thrilled with the, you know, the, 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 those stories and adventures and, and the reaction has been, um, overwhelming and, and, uh, you know, even, um, thankfully tolerant for my, um, schedule because I, you know, I delayed everything, you know, it, it, it took so much work to do it, but I wanted it perfect. And so we, there were epic delays in doing it, but I appreciate everybody sort of hanging with us and sticking with it and enjoying the story. Cause it is exactly what I wanted it to be and say and do and, and accomplish. And um, I'm glad everybody liked it as well. So I have to ask, mm-hmm. was the idea always that it was going to be Mikey as the, mm-hmm. as the last Ronin? Yes. Yeah. No, it was for me, it was, uh, cause even like, you know, my, my hat here has the the first turtle drawing. So even before Michelangelo's Michelangelo, it was uh, a turtle with a mask on with nunchucks, um, and, and that was sort of firstborn. Um, so it was always um, to me, it was there was no other choice. But also, as as the character of Mikey that we've gotten to know, Mikey as a character, he's the one least likely to have to fulfill this role. So he sort of had the the furthest journey, the furthest lengths of um change and and um you know to become what he needed to become to finally end this issue um of of this um um, act of uh, revenge and redemption and things for his family this act of vengeance um and so it was uh, it was a great character to explore character trait to just what a really put someone like that through the paces of what he needed to become to, to do this. And so it was, um, it worked out great, but to me it was, uh, Mikey was, it was never a second choice. So. so at systematic ecology, we, we, it's, we, we intersect the Christian and the nerd, right? We, we explore things from a, from a deeper layer and, and different things like that. And so with the last Ronin, this has been such a ride to really dive into a story beat that has familiar faces, mm-hmm. but maybe tells a, it tells a story from a different angle that is so rich in nuance and neat and implication that it, the, the, the ride has just been out of bounds. Uh, thanks. You know, it's, um, you know, I guess it's, it's, it, it's sort of, you know, I was brought up by, you know, uh, as a Christian background, you know, my, my mom's side of the family was Catholic. My dad's side was, was, was Christian. We did, um, we went to church and, and did, um, and that was an important part and a big part of my early life. And, and I think just what I was able to um, ab- absorb from that as a balance of all things in the universe, which is, you know, good versus evil, um, right and wrong, um, balance of just general morality, being exposed to that and be able to make the decisions for yourself, like, you know, in, in normal life or, or, you know, your beliefs and that thing. And that's keeping that balance and staying true to what is important to you as a, um, as a person, but also as a, you know, and that becomes an important part of your storytelling devices and, and what kind of message you want to send, with your characters, with the kind of stories you tell. So it was all those things um, included, you know, the passion for the pop culture, the genre, uh, morality, and, and just sort of things that um, I believed in the kind of story that I wanted to read. Because at the end of the day, you have to write the material for yourself. Hopefully the fans, um, you know, uh, if they if they, if they they find it great, then great. But, you know, they, you can't write to them or for them. You write for yourself. And hopefully that's, that's something that works with them. So, uh, and it's been just fantastic you know it's a um, um a really good feeling and, and i'm really appreciative of uh, the support um and the success of the series so. cool i told one of the other uh co-hosts that i would ask is there any plan for a movie 
You know, that's a good question. And, you know, with all things turtles, it's, um, you know, I, I sold my rights to them many years ago, and I still work on all different aspects of the turtles entertainment empire and Nickelodeon, who's been so fantastic to work with and uh, um, brings me into to do different things. But it's, it's sort of right now with uh, Seth Rogen's new version of the turtles and other things going, um, we don't know if Ronan will go beyond um, what it is right now, maybe down, down the road in the future, but that was, never the intent um and that um you know i wanted to tell tom and i you know everybody at idw wanted this story to be exactly what it was a really great um comic story um written for ourselves written for the fans um to hopefully enjoy and, and to tell this this important story and then continue um if it was received well enough other adventures in the turtles multiverse of the comic so um we'll see where it goes and you know uh, you know, I, I know that there's a couple of companies making toys, which is exciting. Right. You know, Playmates is doing yeah. a great last run in toy. Nick, um, NECA is doing some wonderful versions. So that's that's a huge thing to me because I've got lots of them. <laughs> we have <laughs> our whole house is full of toys, and like you have, in, right. you know, you like your collection behind you. It's like we we love our our, our um, uh, uh, little inspirations, our little collections. Yeah. So, so as we wrap it up here, um, we always like to we always like to ask, what are you geeking out on right now, and do you have any geeky recommendations for the listeners? Oh goodness, um, what am I geeking out on right now? Um, hmm, it's all things. I guess you know it's hard to pin it down to one particular thing. I still love comics. I still get to the comic store as often as I can. Um, I was lucky enough to go see, you know, we went and saw the Doctor Strange movie over the weekend, which was just, you know, was it was great to see um, through the eyes of our, our son. Uh, Courtney and I have a son that's going to be 16 um, this summer and uh, and sort of what he sees in a, in a character like Doctor Strange, which I, was one of my favorite characters when I was younger. And it's sort of, you know, he's like, wow, that was fantastic. And I said, yeah, a lot of that's in the comic. You know, it's a lot of it's based in this universe. So, but they, they do such a great job with those um, things. So I guess it's uh, still a full on enjoyment of um, all things pop culture and, uh, you know, Star Wars or Star Trek and the new Star Trek Discovery is awesome. And it's just, you know, I, I just roll with it, enjoy it and, and, and um, just be a big geek because <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I'm going to go to the comic store today, I think. Well, I appreciate your time today, and uh, I'd love to do this again sometime. This was an Anazal Ministries podcast. If you enjoyed this show and would like to learn more about our network, be sure to check out the Anazal Ministries podcast network.